in the future of healthcare and nationally, uh, I think you could do a whole other podcast, frankly, on this pandemic, probably in another six to eight months, just looking back and how we responded. Welcome to the Business of Healthcare podcast from the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management. The center is based at the Naveen Jindal School of Management at the University of Texas at Dallas. The show, like the center, brings together business leaders and other forward thinkers to discuss how best to meet the challenges of a rapidly changing, increasingly complex healthcare industry. I'm your host, Dr. Bob Kaiser, Director of the Master's Program in Healthcare Leadership and Management for Professionals. Today we have a special session with two guests, Dr. Britt Barrett. He's the former CEO of Medical City and Medical City Children's here in Dallas. He's also the recent past president of Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital in Dallas, which is a 900-bed acute care facility. He was the executive VP of Texas Health Resources, one of the largest integrated healthcare systems in the country. In 2014, Dr. Barrett joined the Jindal School of Management at UT Dallas as a director of the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management, and also Matt Troop, who is the CEO of Conway Regional Medical Center. So we're delighted, Britt, to have you and let you introduce our guest. Matt, true. Bob, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be with you. And thank you for taking the time. This podcast is a tremendous vehicle. I, I'm just inspired by the information we're sharing. And in light of what's going on today, we thought there'd be value in bringing in real life leaders. Um, I'm just delighted to call Matt, not only a colleague, but a dear friend. He and I worked together years ago as, as he served as a CEO within THR. We've worked very closely together over the decades. Now he's the CEO of Conway Regional Healthcare Systems and has tremendous experience in the industry. Matt, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get to where you are right now? What was the journey that you took to sit in the seat of a a very significant healthcare system? Well, first of all, Britt, thank you for for having me. It's it's great to hear you and sort of see you uh, via Zoom here today. Um, you know, I've had a very interesting uh, career. I've been very blessed to work in a lot of very different settings, uh, small hospitals, uh, large hospitals, urban markets, uh, rural markets. Uh, my journey really began there at uh, what I like to call Presbyterian Hospital of Dallas. Uh, I was born there back in, uh, well, I won't give the year, but it was a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, I had the privilege of going to do an administrative residency there and had a fantastic experience actually got to work uh, as a resident during the creation of Texas Health Resources. So I got wow. to be high on the wall during a lot of wow. those meetings and see how uh, two you know, faith-based nonprofits uh, came together to create uh, Texas Health Resources. And um, throughout my career, I spent a little bit of time there, uh, left, came back, and um, have since been in, since leaving THR in 2011, have been in uh, Oklahoma, Florida, and then now here in Arkansas. So uh, I came up to Conway in 2015 uh, in September as part of a management agreement between uh, Conway Regional uh, Health System and CHI St. Vincent out of Little Rock. If we could, we would take hours to talk about your successes there because they're phenomenal. And if anyone wants to do a little research on how to lead organizational change, You got to talk to Matt about that, but that's not the topic of the conversation today. We'll leave that for another day. But Matt, thank you for taking the time. We live in some of the most interesting times of healthcare. The pandemic has had an impact not only on healthcare, but the entire economy. We have to ask three important questions. Matt, what were you doing, you and your team, to prepare for this pandemic? Second, what are you doing today in a leadership role? to lead change? And third, what do you think the future is going to hold for healthcare leaders? So what do you think? Share with us how you guys kind of prepared for something that was completely unexpected. You know, it's um, difficult to answer that question as I've had so many conversations here at Conway Regional in our community. Uh, It's hard to express just how unprecedented this is. We have an administrative resident with us um, here, and I, I recall turning to him and saying, you know, if he has a, another 40 years in, in this field, he'll probably never see something like this ever again. That's uh, so true. Where, where an organization has to, you know, adapt. But uh, just to your point, you know, I, I mentioned to several people, and, and certainly my wife and I have had a lot of pillow talk about this, that, that this is what we're prepared for in healthcare. We, we talk about it 
constantly. We go through tabletop exercises of disasters, you know, mainly the uh, run of the mill uh, hurricane, <laughs> tornado, mm-hmm. uh, you know, earthquake, if, if that's a thing uh, in your area. Uh, we're well prepared for those kinds of things. But well, let's let's pause for a minute because that's something most people don't realize. They don't realize that you actually go through scenarios. You actually not only tabletop, but you you bring in patients that are you know with uh, with makeup on. I mean, that's a common activity for hospitals, is it not? Uh, absolutely. Um, we we have common, uh, like I said, tabletop exercises, or yeah, we'll have patients, we'll have to figure out how to triage them. Oftentimes, it's in coordination with other hospitals or, or local uh, EMS providers, Good. so yeah. that you kind of know um, how to work with others. Um, so uh, in every plan, inherent in every plan is flexibility. Um, and what you'll see in most hospital plans, to kind of do your point of preparation, is flexibility and, and kind of the general structure for how you respond to something like this. Um, yeah. because more often than not, as you know, Mike Tyson used to say, you, you can start out with a plan and it, it all changes when you get punched in the face. And so, <laughs> uh, you know, you, you, you gotta have a plan. Uh, it's important to go through a plan. Uh, there's value in it, but you know, you gotta be able to adapt. Uh, and there's some stark realities like a punch in the face that make you have to adapt quickly. Yeah. I don't think you ever could have imagined a pandemic scenario right i mean but you've been preparing you've been uh, exercising resources you've been bringing personnel in play you've orchestrated new policies and procedures tell us a little bit about what you're learning in the day-to-day right now about how to deal with a pandemic what are what are some of your aha moments or takeaways or things that you're doing that would be of interest You know, it is a learning opportunity. Um, And so just as our plan calls for, uh, we had to create structure and really more so than a a playbook that tells you how to respond to pandemic. You got to have a structure that can take all these problems, take all these challenges, process them and come up with a, a structure and a response. What's so unique about this situation is that it is uh, equivalent to rationing down your capacity significantly because we're canceling elective cases in anticipation of a surge. And as, as you know, Britt, from your experience, there's nothing more financially draining than an empty hospital. That's uh, exactly right. <laughs> there is, and, and sad from my heart, you know, I just as a an hospital administrator, that pains me to see any hospital uh, empty. But it is true. So things that we've learned to be adaptable, to be nimble, to be innovative. And, you know, there is uh, that expression, and I forget how it goes exactly, but, you know, the, the, the necessity of invention, right? When you get into these crisis situations, there's a necessity to invent and to innovate that you've not perhaps had before. And you find out exactly what your team can do when you start eliminating barriers and getting a group of men and women who are intelligent and focused. Um, and so, you, yeah, you've got a lot of people that are remote working that are actually part of the Fabulous Hospital, obviously, but you probably got a lot of remote workers now. Is that right? Oh, yeah. We've sent over 100 people home, which is kind of an interesting dynamic because they want to be here. I mean, they really uh, they want to be here. Their, their, their hospital is in the throes of a battle and they're having to be on the outside. And so some of what we're trying to do is to you know, use them as resources to interface with the community. You know, we have lots of people wanting to make masks, uh, wanting to make gowns. Yeah, need people on the outside that can engage with them and be our voice when we're tied up, you know, doing pandemic stuff, so to speak. So um, everybody's got to have a role. But yeah, we, we got to send a lot of people out of here with, that, that don't want to leave, but need to be home. This episode is brought to you by the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management, the definitive resource for healthcare management education in North Texas. The center is based in the Naveen Jindal School of Management at the University of Texas at Dallas. It plays a unique role in training the next generation of healthcare leaders to meet local, regional, and national demands. The Jindal School uses its strengths in accounting, administration, finance, marketing, and information systems to educate highly qualified personnel for healthcare administration and executive leadership positions. The center is home to seven healthcare leadership and management programs, including undergraduate and graduate programs, as well as executive programs for physicians and working professionals. For more information, visit us online at jindal.utdallas.edu forward slash healthcare. One thing I know about you is you 
you really care about the team and you're a master of creating a culture. And you shared with me previously some, some initiatives that you've, you've employed to help the team, you know, kind of feel appreciated and respected. Not necessarily what you did, but what was, what was your thinking behind the scenes when you, when you were thinking about innovative new ideas to strengthen the team? What was your thought process behind that? What, what was going on in your mind? You know, any incident command is going to, going to speak to how you deploy resources, physical and, and human. They're going to talk about public relations, utilities, kind of the nuts and bolts of, of running a hospital. But, you know, pretty early on, it dawned on me that this is going to be a high anxiety time. This is a yeah. virus that is very stealth-like um, and just observing, you know, just being observant around the men and women uh, around the table, so to speak, who were with me and their anxiety knew that we had to have wellness as part of our incident command. And so we have a, a wellness officer. Uh, that's not her real title, but um, her <laughs> job is to think about us and to think about the staff Good. and how we can serve the staff. And so, I mean, some of the things that, that we've done, we have a relaxation room. So since we're not meeting, uh, we, we sequestered a conference room. Uh, we have six massage chairs in there. We've got gentle music. The lights are down low. There's aromatherapy, you know, nice little snacks and staff can go in there just to kind of get away and unwind. We have a, uh, a exercise room. So we've got treadmills and bikes and that kind of stuff in there. We have a fitness center that we've had to close because of the pandemic, but we now use that as a daycare. And so it's a life care that can take care of our staff who, because of school closings, didn't have any other options and some child care centers that have closed. Um, and and that, that kind of concept really hit me when I was reflecting on the Ebola issue in, in Dallas and talking to a lot of my colleagues and your colleagues in Dallas who, who couldn't get their child into daycare because the cha- daycare wouldn't take them because they were afraid that their child was infected and they were ostracized. And that just that pains me so much that healthcare workers have to go through that. So I wanted to, us to have an option to do that ourselves. So we provide child care for free. Um, we uh, provide free lunch so staff don't have to even worry about getting out of the hospital or, or um, even bringing their own lunch. We'll provide lunch for them. So we feed them every day and we over communicate. <laughs> we communicate daily about things going on, how we're responding, our processes really to try to address. I mean, as you know, when there is a gap of information, um, people tend to freak out. And when you lose yeah. the loss of control, yeah. it's something like this. When you're not meeting with people, you're not talking to them face to face, they sense a loss of control. And that, that's what rides, you know, drives anxiety more than anything. You know, Matt, we need to write an article on this because I think your experiences, the things that you intuitively embarked on, whether that's massage therapy, physical uh, food, uh, child care, those are just indicative of leading a culture through organizational change. And uh, I can't help but think that organizations are able to do what you're doing will come out on the backside of this much more successful and well prepared for the future. So let's pivot there. What do you think the future is going to hold? You're investing a tremendous amount of time, energy, and resources. Financially, I don't know how you're going to make it. I mean, it just it just seems overwhelming. But what do you think the future will be like? What what changes do you see in the healthcare delivery space? Well, I'll I'll, I'll speak to Conway Regional first, and then kind of get get more broad. It's funny, um, you know, we have a ask the CEO email, and one of the questions that I got was, "Will the relaxation room go away when the pandemic <laughs> is over?" <laughs> <laughs> It'll you know, so, turn into a torture chamber. That's what it'll yeah, turn into. Get back to work. Get back to work. Get back to work, yeah. Oh, gosh. So, uh, but in all seriousness, you know, in my ponderings as a CEO, when I have heads up time, you know, and I, and I think about the integration of people's faith, people's, you know, personal life and their work, you yeah. know, I don't think these are buckets that we can separate. Um, I think practically Good. it's not about separation. It's about integration. And I've always had this dream of, of having a daycare center that would have uh, our employees in it, that we would come together as a family. I always had a nice. dream to make life easier by serving people food and allowing people to take food home for their families uh, from their work. So all these dreams that I've an, on, an on-site fitness center, a uh, place where people can go unwind. 
all these dreams that I've had are now are actually coming true. And so I'm <laughs> through the pandemic, I'm getting to do all these cool things that I've always wanted to do. And hopefully some of those will sustain. I think, you know, even telemedicine, we've been on the fence about telemedicine and how to implement it. And with this pandemic, we don't really have any other options. So we're, we're really ramping up fast. And within, you know, a very short period of time, we're doing telemedicine full bore. Um, so it's kind of cool to see things that you have needed to do, wanted to do, um, become a, a reality and actually getting it done. In the future of healthcare and nationally, uh, I think you could do a whole other podcast, frankly, on this pandemic, probably in another six to eight months, just looking back and how we responded. I think people's awareness of infection prevention and the importance of not just hand hygiene, but staying home when you're sick. We have a process here now where every person that walks into this hospital is screened. So we have a no visitor policy. We just went to that this week. Uh, All employees are getting scanned, temperature scanned, that is, when they come in. And I I am embarrassed to say to a degree, we've actually had to send some people home because their temp was too high or maybe they didn't didn't feel well. You know, there is an ethic, a work ethic in healthcare that you just plow through it. And I I don't think that's okay anymore. And we're going to have to be more diligent about um, infection prevention. I think all those infection preventionists out there that have been preaching this for so long are going to finally feel so empowered that they're going to have a lot of weight behind what they do. Because I think I think if we could act like this, at least a fraction of this, think of the lives that we can save, think of the hospitalizations that we can avoid. And that's what this pandemic is teaching us. It's a, it's a hard lesson. But I think those are the lessons I think that we can learn and take future um, outbreaks more seriously. Well, I think you're absolutely right. Some have said this is just a dry run for something more lethal. That may be true, but it, it's expiring to see the lessons that are learned, the innovative ideas that are coming out, and that I think we've moved in a direction and we're not going back in a very positive direction. Some of the things you've shared are strengthening for an organization, and we're going to be moving in that direction. Uh, communications, telemedicine, looking at staff and their their personal lives that blend into their professional lives. I, I think it's all very exciting. I, I couldn't be more grateful for you, Matt. I, I think I speak for all of us who are not sitting in the chair that are not uh, in the trenches right now, how grateful for we are for your leadership and the impact that you have on the community you serve. Uh, we're praying for you. We're supporting you. We'll do everything we can to help you and your organization. But uh, I think, I, as I mentioned, to speak for everyone when we say thank you for, for great work at Conway Regional Health Systems. Well, you bet. And thank you for having me on. And, and if you ever want to come back and maybe sit in a chair, take over for a while, maybe I'll, I don't know if I'll take a vacation anywhere, but you know, your door's always open. Not a chance in the world. Not a chance <laughs> in the world. So, well, Bob, we, thanks for letting us jump in here. It's been a yes, delight well, to be you, with you. Thank you both. Yeah. We, we, we just heard from Dr. Britt Barrett and also the CEO of Conway Regional Medical Center, Matt Troop. And this has been a very engaging, upfront discussion. So thank you both for your time. Uh, Matt, thank you for your servant leadership and all that you're doing. And we wish you the best as you deal with this moving forward. Thank Back you. Thanks for having me. podcast for us here. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Business of Healthcare podcast. Join us online at businessofhealthcarepodcast.com to find episode links, notes, and more. Be sure to subscribe to the Business of Healthcare podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app. To learn more about the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management, go to jundle.utdallas.edu and then search under the Center and Institutes tab on the navigation menu. Also, we want to hear from you. If you'd like to provide feedback, make suggestions for future guests or show topics, or just want to get in touch with us, email us at healthcarebizpodcasts at utdallas.edu. Biz is spelled B-I-Z. And let us know how we're doing. I'm your host, Dr. Bob Kaiser, with the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management, where we're leading change by changing how we lead. 